stand with me this evening and take your hymnals and turn to hymn 204. We'll sing all six verses of the first Noel, hymn 204. Good to have you tonight. Uh, as we pray, let me encourage you to uh, pray. A number of our families are sick <clears throat> uh, with uh, colds. And then uh, <clears throat> Margaret Curry, it's been posted on the Facebook page if you're following that in the group. Margaret 
Curry's sister-in-law, who was 57, passed away uh, last night, and so pray for the family there with that. So just a lot of things going on um, <clears throat> during, this, during this season. Let's go together to the Lord. Well, Father, we do pray for uh, our brothers and sisters and their physical health, and we ask that you would give to them grace and healing, and we pray that uh, their illnesses would would be quickly relieved and only inconveniences and nothing more severe than that. We pray for your grace for all who are uh, suffering and uh, in times of uncertainty. And we thank you, God, for the kind grace that we have in having you as our rock, as that which is unmovable and unshakable and unchanging in a constantly shifting world. And we thank you for this. We pray your blessing uh, upon the life of our church, that we would have your help to be all that you want your people to be for your glory. We pray that you would use our services towards that end. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. If you'll take your hymnals again and just turn a few pages forward to hymn 208. We'll sing all three verses of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, hymn 208. one page to hymn 207. We'll sing all three verses of He is Born, hymn 207.
Stand with me again and take your hymnals and turn to hymn 206. We'll sing all four verses of Angels from the Realms of Glory, hymn 206. Just leave your content. 
seated. Thank you. Turn tonight to Philippians chapter number one. <clears throat> Philippians chapter number one. So where we are in our study in the book of Romans would be Romans chapter 14, which we kind of sort of looked at last Sunday morning and didn't really want to jump right back into that. And it's in my preaching calendar mind, Christmas, so <clears throat> thought it would be a good opportunity to turn our attention away from uh, the book of Romans for a little bit. And so I thought tonight it would be to our benefit to look at a passage in the book of Philippians, something that I hope describes us as a church. Um, I think, of course, every church uh, would desire to improve in every area, and no church would claim to be perfect in all areas. But in the passage that we're going to read this evening, Paul is thanking God for the Philippians and encouraging them on the path of being like-minded, on the path of being like-minded. And it is a great blessing to any ministry to, to be like-minded about things, which doesn't mean that everybody wants entirely all the same things. Um, I was thinking about this in... In, uh, <clears throat> while the choir was practicing tonight. A, a, a like-minded choir doesn't mean that everybody sings the same part. But a like-minded choir means that everybody sings the same song and they all sing the part that is their part to sing. And if they all sing the same song in harmony, we have a beautiful sound and a like-minded choir. And that's kind of how 
uh, I think that we need to think about this, not that we all uh, have the same tastes and appetites in all things, but that we are all, as we would say, on the same page. Let's go ahead and stand, please. I'm going to begin in verse number 27 of Philippians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Philippians 1.27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me, and now here to be in me. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that she be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us tonight to pray that you would help me to faithfully deal with the text of Scripture. I pray that you would help us to take these words to our hearts, Father, that we would not pass them off, so to speak, upon the backs of others, but that we would ask your Spirit to inquire of us whether this would be true of us. And I pray this blessing upon us, that we would be like-minded. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> well, Philippians is, with good justification, one of the most beloved books of the, certainly of the epistles of Paul's letters. Its occasion is a, to be a thank you note. Um, Paul started this church. We can read about that in Acts chapter 16. Um, Acts 16, 12 tells us, From thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. Lydia was saved. Lydia was baptized. Lydia opened her home to Paul. Um, <clears throat> and it was at Philippi that Paul cast an unclean spirit out of a young woman, which brought him much further persecution, and put him in jail, which led then to the Philippian jailer and his conversion and an earthquake. And so memorable was, were the events at Philippi that Paul writes to the Thessalonians that we were shamefully entreated at Philippi. The, treat, the treatment we received in the city of Philippi was outlandish. It was outrageous. And yet this faithful band of believers continues and they have what appears to be a very special love for Paul. That this was the only church, a, a, quite honestly a little bit of a mystery uh, to me as a New Testament pastor as we sort through a biblical philosophy of missions. This was the only church that regularly supported Paul in his missionary endeavors, that no other church communicated with him as concerning giving and receiving. And again, the occasion of the letter, the reason that Paul writes the letter humanly is to thank them for yet one more time, their generous financial support. Paul is in jail. The people are providing for him financially. They are praying for him. They love him, and that love is reciprocated. He says to them in verse number 3 and 4 of chapter 1, I thank my God 
upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. So this was a faithful band of people and people that he loved. And yet, if there apparently is one chink in their armor, if there is one flaw in the local ministry, it appears to be this, right? There is the begging, I beseech Syntyche and Eutyche, 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 to be of the same mind in the Lord. There is some tension somewhere at some level among the believers in this assembly. And so the very idea of like-mindedness streams through it, particularly the end of chapter 1 into chapter 2. And as you well know, folks, we didn't read it, but it is certainly um, appropriate to the flow of thought. Paul is going to conclude this application to them and then turn his attention to the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. A like-mindedness, the goal of like-mindedness is, is ultimately that, that we have the mind of Christ about things. So, and quite honestly, it was, it, it was a little bit of, of the, uh, well, we'll get into it in the text, but as I thought about the Christmas season and I thought about what to preach and I quite honestly didn't want to bring up Romans chapter 14 just yet, it is the giftedness nature of this passage, which we may not at first glance think about, but, but Paul is making a couple of arguments here that our like-mindedness is anchored in, to some measure, in God's generosity to us that drove me to this passage. So let's just kind of work our way through it, right? Nothing that we're not familiar with, nothing that is really uh, stunningly new, but a reminder of things that are always necessary in a local church. In chapter 1, verses 27 through 30, Paul is pointing out to them that it is the calling of God's people to be in conflict for their Savior. It is the calling of God's people to be in conflict for their Savior. Verse number 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition to you of salvation and that of God, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. It is the calling of Christians to be in conflict for their Savior. Paul begins by pointing out to them that the single focus of their lives should be that they live a life that is worthy of the gospel, only let your conversation be this one thing, this thing and this thing alone. Let your lifestyle be suitable, be appropriate. That's what is behind the idea of becometh. Let your conversation, let the way you live be suitable or appropriate to the gospel of Christ. And this is to exist in us regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. How wonderful it must have been for the Philippians when Paul made a visit to them, when they received a letter from Paul. How pleasant that was. But what if Paul never comes back? What if Paul doesn't get out of prison? What if they never see him again? Well, that's what he's getting at in verse number 27. That whether, I'm, whether I see you or whether you never see me again, there is supposed to be, folks, a constancy 
to our Christianity that is independent in this particular instance of the people in our lives. We're glad for the relationships that we have with people. We are blessed by the good fellowship of other people. But our Christianity cannot lay upon the foundation of other people's presence nor erode because other people are absent. Whether we have the intimacy of Paul or our Paul-like person or not, our lives should reflect the worthiness of the gospel of Christ. And that extends even into the realm of persecution. This is what Paul is talking about in verse number 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. And as Paul goes on in verse number 30, having the same conflict which he saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul was fully expectant, and he told the Philippians so, that they should anticipate the same kind of treatment that he received. You saw what I've heard, what I experienced when I came there. You hear what is happening to me now. You should expect the same. Don't let your adversaries terrify you. They will interpret that to be weakness, but we understand it to be something different. We understand the persecution to have a different purpose. And this is because, verse number 29, this conflict, and let us be realistic, folks, it is something from which we naturally recoil. We do not like it. We do not want to suffer. We don't want to suffer persecution, and we don't want to suffer the loss of personal relationships. But here is what verse 29 tells us. For unto you, and I'm going to translate the word, for unto you it is graced in the behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. This is God's gift to us. That we are to suffer for his sake. <clears throat> I will no doubt make reference of this in a couple of weeks in a Sunday morning sermon. But in the 16th century, a nun, and we take that for what it's worth. A nun was experiencing a very severe time of depression and persecution, and she recounts how when she went to bed one night, God gave her a vision from the book of Job, and God said to her, this is how I treat all my friends. To which she responded, this is why you have so few of them. This is a grace that is given to us, that we should suffer for his sake. God's gift to his people it is a grace. Right? We talk about God's grace in saving us. And this is, Paul mentions that. For unto you it is grace given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe in Him. What a, what a great grace that God has done that He has given us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the gift of faith. But He has also given us the gift of suffering. Something that is not pleasant at the moment but something that has great payout at the end. Suffering on behalf of Christ. And the word that Paul uses there, suffering, is a word that we know. It is the word agony. To suffer with a Paul-like agony. And we're not going to do it, but you could just go back and read Philippians cha or Acts chapter 16 to read in detail how Paul was treated in Philippi. It was not a warm reception. So Paul begins by pointing out to them that it is the calling of God's people to suffer for the name of Christ. And this is a gift. And because that suffering is a gift, that suffering should never impede our like-mindedness, our singleness of purpose, Verse number 27, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ, 
whether I come and see or be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The blessing of a like-minded body of believers. But Paul does not leave us there, moving on into what to us is chapter 2, but was no difference in thought in, to Paul. He goes on to point out that conflict is not the only gift that we have. And so verse number 1 of chapter number 2. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. If I could just take a moment and make a quick observation about the grammar. When we in English read the word if, we almost always read it as some kind of condition. Always reading it, almost always reading it with the possibility that the condition is going to be unfulfilled. If this happens, then these will be the consequences. But there is a possibility that it won't happen. And in English, it tends to be rather inflexible. That just tends to be the way we think about the word if. But that is not at all the way Paul thought about the word that he was using. To him, it was much less rigid like that. And the word actually carries with it more of the sentiment of since. Not some kind of a condition that may go unfulfilled. But since something has happened, there are going to be these kinds of consequences. And Paul makes a contrast that is alliterated for us by our King James Bible. Look at chapter 1 in verse number 30. Having the same conflict. Conflict is our calling. Conflict is our gift. Chapter 2 in verse number 1. And again, let me kind of translate it with probably the, the way that we should think about it. Since... There is consolation. One of the things that God gives to us is conflict for His name. And one of the things that God gives to us is consolation. Yet another gift. It is God's gift to us that we should agonize for Christ. God has also given us that we have consolation in Christ. And Paul talks about that consolation in verse number 1 in some detail. If there be any, therefore, any consolation in Christ. There is real consolation, folks. Our God is not a far-off, distant helper. He is not the cosmic sympathizer. Boy, I really feel bad for you. It's a tough spot that you're in. Glad it's not happening to me. Not that kind of God. But as the psalmist says, a very present help in time of trouble. A very real helper. And that consolation takes a variety of forms. That's what he is getting at there in the rest of verse number 1. If there is any comfort of love. And that's, right, what, what does Paul mean by the comfort of love? And, and the reality is that it's a pretty rare word in the in the text of Scripture, we have to go to secular Greek writing to help understand the meaning of the word. And the meaning of the word as easing or abatement. Think of it this way, folks. God calls us to suffer for the sake of His name. Is there any consolation that accompanies that suffering? What takes the edge off of Christian suffering? It is the comfort of love. It is the knowledge that that suffering is God's gift given to us for God's purposes. That's what is supposed to be taking some of the sting out of our suffering. 
is our understanding of why it is happening. Just as if when you try to explain to your children that their discipline was a function of your love. Now, they did not always welcome it that way, but they were able as they got older to look back upon it and to see it through that lens. That you weren't just being mean to them, that you were trying to accomplish something in their lives for their greater good. If there is any comfort of love, And again, Paul is not suggesting that there isn't a comfort of love. He is arguing that there is a comfort of love. That we have genuine consolation in Christ, which includes the easing of our suffering in the knowledge of His love. And then he says, any fellowship of the Spirit we have the real communion of the Holy Spirit and the real fellowship of the Spirit and the real position of being a member of the body of Christ. And we have genuine mercy. And again, it reads a little weird to our Western ears, if any bowels and mercies. If I could get grammatically technical for just a second... Bowels and mercies are what we call a, a hendiadis, two words describing the same idea. Like we would talk about being nice and warm. Right? When we talk about right, going home and sitting on our couch and covering up with a blanket, being nice and warm, we understand we're using two words to convey one meaning. Since there are bowels and mercies, since there is genuine, we would call it heartfelt consolation. Mercies that come from the depths of God's emotion. Not superficial compassion, but genuine compassion. God genuinely shows us His mercy. So we have these gifts. One of those gifts is the gift of suffering for Christ. And one of those gifts is the gift of consolation in the face of that suffering. And it is the base then upon this very real giving of gifts that Paul gives us a commandment. Verse number 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. When you get to fulfill in verse number 2, you have a command, an imperative. Not a wish. Not a wish. It's not like a Christmas list where we put on it things we'd really like to have. So that we could kind of read it like this, right? Paul writes to the Philippians and says to them, you know, you're a great joy to me. Every time I think about you, I just thank God for you. And and I am so grateful for our fellowship in the gospel and you make me very happy. Now fill up my joy. Fill my joy to the top. Fill it all the way up. It's a command. It's an imperative. And what Paul is seeking, what it would require to fill his joy, is this, verse number 2. Fulfill my joy, ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Not really hard to figure out what he's after, is it? Not really, not really difficult when you read the book of Philippians, right? To, to, to put your finger on what Paul wants for that beloved assembly. Wouldn't an adequate word be unity? 
genuine unity, not everybody has to eat vanilla ice cream kind of unity. As somebody said, unity, not uniformity. Fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, <clears throat> having the same love, being of one accord, being of one mind. Well, unity about what? Well, the first thing <clears throat> is back in chapter 1 and verse number 27, that we stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. We ought to be unified in this, folks. We ought to be unified about Bible truth. We ought to be unified about the significance of Bible truth, what the gospel is, what the gospel is not. But I think we also ought to be unified about understanding the role of suffering in the lives of believers, which again, is not something that we go out and seek, and it is not something that we celebrate, but it is something that we endure and we recognize that it is going to come. And, and folks, we don't orient our lives around getting out of suffering. We don't, we don't make the focus of all that we do trying to alleviate and escape any kind of suffering for Christ. Because we have His mind. Right? And again, remember the passage is leading us into the great mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 5 and 8, 5 through 8, and what that accomplished in his own life. And so Paul talks to us a little bit about the mechanics of this. More than the philosophy of it, he talks to us about the mechanics of it. What's going to impede like-mindedness in an assembly? Well, verse number 3 Right? Here are some negative things. Here are some things that if they come in are going to disrupt the like-mindedness of a body of believers. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. The word strife refers to candidating for office. running for office, right? And one thing, right, we're getting ready, folks, in, in not terribly long to have another set of elections, and what we're going to have are candidates. And what candidates are going to do is say, pick me and not him, or pick me and not her. And we're going to have all the ghosts of electioneering, name-calling, slander, in many cases, a willingness to misrepresent what a person has said or done. All to get the vote. Churches should not be like that. Churches should not be a place where people come and campaign for their own status and their own celebrity. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Vainglory, prominence for the sake of being seen. Empty glory, glory that accomplishes nothing. What do you want? I just want to be somebody. I just want everybody to see me. I just want to be known. I just want to have a place. Okay, those are great impediments to the like-mindedness of a church. When somebody in a body of believers walks in the door with the agenda that they will advance their position or they will advance their person, right? The, the price that we're going to pay for that is like-mindedness. So not that, but instead this, verse number three, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. <clears throat> Have a low opinion of yourself. And there's just no other way to get it. There's just no other way to deal with the, with the sentence faithfully. 
In Acts chapter 20, in verse number 19, Paul said to the church at Ephesus, I have served you with humility of mind. That's the word, humility. In lowliness of mind, in humility of mind, in Colossians 3.12, it is translated humbleness of mind. Let every man bring his mind low. How low does God want me to bring my mind? How low is low enough? Well, we have an answer. Actually, we have two answers. One of them we're going to look at and one I will just make reference to. This low, verse number three, in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, this doesn't mean, I don't think that Paul is arguing that we consider every position superior. And it's certainly in light of what he tells us in verse number 27 of chapter 1, that we abandon Bible truth for the sake of so-called unity. But the general consensus that ought to characterize us is that other people are better than we are. We don't walk in the door thinking, I'm the best, look at me, I want to be seen, everybody else wait for me. We walk in the door thinking, everybody else is ahead of me. And this is not just simply a mental exercise. I think that it plays out in verse number four. Look, look not every man on his own things, right? which we are going to do by default. We are going to think about ourselves. That is unavoidable. I don't think Paul is even arguing against that. I think from the way he's speaking, right? In addition to looking out for yourself, which you're going to be doing intuitively anyway, add this. Let every man also on the things of others. Now those are, those are great slogans, aren't they? I mean, that would, make, that would make wonderful cross stitch and hung on a wall. But that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is to give us instruction about how to think. Right? So how low, how low would I go? Verse number three, this low to let everybody esteem other than themselves. We talked about that. How low? Well, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Think about how low Christ was willing to go. Think about how humiliated Christ was willing to be. A servant to the point of being considered a criminal, to the point of being put to death for crimes he did not commit. That low. You know, one of the problems, folks, if I could just kind of wax psychological for a moment, is that we tend to judge other people pretty much exclusively on what they do, how they treated me. But we rarely judge ourselves that way. We judge ourselves by what we intended and what we meant. So we tend to give ourselves a lot of latitude. I know that it appeared to be this way, but I didn't really mean it this way. Cut me some slack. But when the tables are turned, we tend to not cut that slack. You just failed to deliver when I needed it. So we have these two gifts that have been given to us, the gift of Christ's consolation and the gift of Christ's conflict. And on the basis of those gifts, we are to be a like-minded assembly striving together for the faith of the gospel, which is going to involve thinking about each other and interacting with each other in a particular way. And I just want to close by raising this question. Is Paul just simply being selfish? Selfish. 
think about what he says. Fulfill my joy. You do this and make me happy. And the answer, folks, has to be obviously not. Paul is not just being hypocritically insensitive. Right? Everybody have the same mind, and here's what I mean by everybody having the same mind. Everybody makes me happy. I think particularly if you would read a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 9, you would see the lengths that Paul was willing to go to extend to others more grace and courtesy than he was willing to demand of them. But let's go ahead and read verses 5 through 8 because they help us to understand the logic of what Paul is doing here. Why is Paul telling me, and he is telling me, to behave a certain way? And that way is to lower myself. To put other people ahead, to put the faith of the gospel in front of my own self, even if that means suffering for the sake of Christ. Even if that means magnifying others at my own expense. Well, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He just keeps going down and down and down and down until you get to verse number 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. So God is not just kind of standing on the sidelines giving us these instructions. I've given you the gift of suffering for me don't let any suffering you experience impede being like-minded about the faith of the gospel. I've given you the gift of consolation. Don't get caught up in promoting yourself. Let your mind be very low. Because that's what I reward. Now, none of us are going to be magnified to the extent that Christ was because none of us are going to be humiliated to the extent that Christ was. But there is a pattern being set forth, folks. We, we live in a clear cause and effect Christian world. Obedience pays off in biblical reward. Here is the instruction Paul is not being selfish. He's not saying some psycho babble of, I want you to look out for me, so I'm going to tell you to not look out for yourself. He is pointing us to Christ, and he is pointing us to the way that God operates. Because Christ brought himself to the lowest point possible, God magnified him to the highest point possible. This is the way God works. Let's pray together tonight. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of the ways at Westwood Heights in which we are like-minded. For a body of mature believers who are resolved to serve you. Not excited about, but willing if needs be to suffer for you. Help us to heed the instruction. Help us to live in faith. Help us to understand that the judgment day and rewards are coming. Help us to not promote ourselves. But help us to look out for the things of others and to esteem others better. We pray this for us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, let me make a couple of announcements and we will stand and have our closing song this morning. Again, just a reminder. Well, let me work through this. So Tuesday night is men's Bible study, 6.30 here at the church. Um, I don't know if there's still some food items left, um, but you can go back and take a look if any of it is anything that you have any interest in. Next Sunday, there will not be any choir. There will not be any choir practice in the evening. There will be a 6 o'clock evening service. There will be the 11 o'clock service. There will not be the 10 o'clock Sunday school hour. And then, gentlemen, the prayer meeting is on, that would normally be January 1st, because it is January 1st, has been rescheduled for January 8th. So I just want you to be aware of that. All right, let's go ahead and stand, please, and we'll have our closing song. If I don't see you Wednesday, Merry Christmas to you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next Sunday. But if not, Happy New Year. If you'll take your hymnals and turn to hymn 210, we'll sing the first verse of Ring the Bells, hymn 210.